Hello and welcome to the 14th episode of When Life Hands You Lenins. This episode is quite special to me because it is my father. And I went home for the holiday season and I brought some of my podcasting gear so that I could sit down with my dad because he has been a vinyl record collector for close to 50 years. And with vinyl having making a comeback in the last three to five years, I thought, I know a guy. So I brought my gear and we sat down and we had a good conversation. He talks a little bit about his band and how he got started vinyl record collecting, and he had no idea that it would amass to be such a huge connect, uh, collection. We also talk a little bit about how to store your records if you're going to start collecting some of the best ways to find new records. We talk a little bit about the, the quality and the condition of vinyl records, and we even talk about how to uh, take care of your vinyl records, as well as some products that you can use, such as needles and turntables and all kinds of different stuff. So before we jump into the episode and my dad kind of introduces himself and he tells you a little bit about who he is and how he got his start collecting vinyl records, I just want to remind you that all of the products that we mention and some additional products will be listed in the show notes below. I also encourage you to sign up to my mailing list, which will notify you when new episodes are live, as well as send you some tips and tricks within the music industry. I also encourage you to support me on Patreon as it greatly helps the show and the money that I use with Patreon will go directly back into the show to better it for all of you. Please leave a five-star rating within Apple Podcasts or whatever platform you decide to listen to podcasts in as it greatly helps boost the show and help it be discovered by other future listeners. And lastly, there is a guest request form in the description as well. So if you or someone you know would be a very good guest on the show, please fill out that form or send it to them and it will come to me and I will reach out and we can get something set up to potentially be a guest on this show. So that's all I have for you. I'll stop rambling now. Here is the 14th episode of When Life Hands You Lennons with my father, Doug Seahawk. So, Dad, why don't you tell us a little bit about when you were in the band and if that kind of factored into how this collection started and tell us a little bit about how you got started into vinyl collecting. Yeah, the band started in, I mean, the first one, we just kind of had some a band with my cousins and we would just play what we liked. And I, I think a lot of the music was what we liked on the radio course and and stuff from some of my albums like a lot of the classic rock would be songs that we liked i mean in early 80s it was everything from lover boy to a little bit of beatles and stuff like that and the when i first started collecting i pretty much just bought stuff that i liked and then when i got into the 45 collecting it got into more of charted material, the Hot 100. First I did Top 40, and then I expanded into the Hot 100. So, uh, in the albums was pretty much, you know, 60s and 70s classic rock, I guess, and stuff that I liked. And uh, Elvis and Beatles are top shelf. And try to do, like, a lot of the R&B stuff on the side with the 45 department. But that's about where it went. So you started collecting 45s and not 33s? Uh, no, I started collecting albums. And I would go to the local record store. It was called Mother's Records at the time. And just go through and find what I would like. I did start collect. I started collecting in probably early 70s. And my first album, I think, was Bob Dylan. First album was probably Bob Dylan. I remember... Like the first five or ten was Bob Dylan, um, John Wesley Harding, Harden, and um, Crow's Greatest Hits, Jay Giles Live, um, uh, Cactus, you know, Beck by what was it, Carmen Appice, and and I don't even remember who the other members were, but it was stuff like that. And once I got 
started. I mean, it just kept on rolling, especially in, during the 80s. I started collecting 45s in probably middle to later 80s, and that's that's where I started doing top 40, marking them off in my Joel Whitburn book, and expanding to the Hot 100. So what initiated that connect collection? Was it just the just the the thought of being able to collect music or what was it the fact that it was vinyl the quality what was it that kind of sparked that oh I want to start collecting now or did you even know at that time you wanted to start collecting no I never did I just I mean I just started collecting the the albums and um there was just so much music music has always been a part of my life and so once I there was so much that I liked and I just had to have it and, you know, we didn't have eBay back in them days, so I had to do record shops, you know, and thrift stores, and there really wasn't a lot to offer because most of it was garbage at thrift stores. But, you know, every once in a while you'd find some stuff, and um, I guess that's where it started, though. It's just mostly what I like to hear. So what was your first record again? Was it Bob Dylan, you said? I remember Bob Dylan being one of the very first ones, John and Wesley Harden. What was the thought process behind that? What was the story behind that? Did you just pick it up and just then kind of spark? I don't remember where I got it from, but yeah, it's like I always I told my mom that I wanted to get a record player, and then she finally bought one in because we didn't have a record player, and that was in 1972, I think. But music, I've always been around music. But, because growing up in my dad's bar and everything, the jukebox was always going. So I always got to hear the latest hits. You know, you, ever since I was just a baby, you know, obviously I don't remember stuff like that. But I do remember songs like, I was born in 1959, and I remember one of the first songs was was a song by uh, Petula Clark called Downtown. And that was in early 1965, very late 64. And I told my mom that whenever that song came on, to let me know what if I was playing outside, to let me, you know, let me know and come in the house and listen to the song. And there was another song, I never knew what it was, but a few years later, I finally, I didn't know the name of it. And a few years later, I found out it was If I Fell by the Beatles. And I remember hearing that one in one of my, you know, when I was really young. And I love that song, I just... There were just something about it that always, it's still one of my favorite Beatles songs. That's, I think that's probably my favorite Beatles song. Yeah. Just because just the emotion behind it, it's simplicity. Yeah. But it's so... It's complex at the same time, the exactly. three-part harmonies. But that's with the, that's the Beatles, all yeah. of their music. Right. It's nothing simple. There's no CF and Gs. <laughs> no, it's no CF and Gs. No perfect cadences at all. So, um, that was, it's, and also it's kind of... It's amazing to see in 50 years how we relied so heavily on the radio. And now to, you know, like you had told your mom to say, let me know when that song is on the radio. And now we can, it's as simple as searching it in Apple Music or Spotify or YouTube and saving it. You can listen to it whenever you want. Whereas back, you know, 30, 40, 50 years ago, you actually had to wait for the radio to play it. Right. And if they, they might not have even played it. So it's, it's, it's amazing to see how far it's come. And I think records are one of the first ways amongst tapes and stuff to kind of come along and have a physical copy and be able to play it whenever you want. So when you started collecting vinyl records, did you know that it would amass to something like 50,000 records and beyond? Uh, no, absolutely not. I had no idea because, you know, like I say, I I didn't start collecting 45s until, you know, the late 80s. And the albums was just buying what I liked. And then the more I, more I found, and it just seemed like, you know, I was able to go to more stores and and find the records. You know, I just, I would pick up you know, anything that I might like, you know, and always trying new stuff and to see what I'd like, you know, and, you know, hey, this is pretty cool. I, I heard about this, you know, I'd buy, you know, like Rolling Stone magazines and see and Cream. I was a big Cream fan. 
uh, magazine that is, well, and the band also, but that magazine and they'd always get, you know, they'd, you know, they'd talk about the latest albums by people and, you know, the Rolling Stones would always have interviews and stuff like that with, with the new albums. But, you know, they, but the, uh, the magazines, everything from, I mean, I did, I liked Cream. I think I subscribed to that, but there was a few others I don't recall right off the top of my head, but, but, you know, they'd always get ideas on what the next album was. Mm-hmm. So in the beginning, when you started kind of realizing that, oh, this is going to be, I guess I'm going to start collecting. This is going to be more than just a hobby. It's going to be kind of my life over the next coming years. How did you keep it organized or how did you figure out how to keep it organized? Well, back when I only had a couple hundred albums, I mean, I would just, they would just be in cardboard boxes. And, you know, up until, I don't know, I probably started when I hit like four or 500 albums. I mean, I didn't have 45s yet. And I would just, that's about when I started putting them in alphabetical order. And, I felt, you know, that's about the easiest way. And then, and then by genre too, like I wouldn't have country mixed up with, with rock and roll. Or jazz mixed up with rock and roll. So, are there other ways you could organize them? Um, but, but just being that they're alphabetical is easiest, right? Yeah, I mean, with the albums, I find it to be the easiest, you know. And then, but with the forty fives, I use Joel Whitburn's book, The Hot One Hundred, and I just mark them off and 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 list them in chronological order as they they hit the Hot One Hundred. So there's no alphabetical order with the 45s. If they didn't chart, well, then they go into a separate section like my R&B charters or my R&Bs, you know, would go all in alphabetical order. But if it hit the charts, country, I do have country ones also. And it's just um, the same way, chronological order as they entered the charts. Okay. So, and you can see here, like, as we're sitting in the music room here is what we call it in the basement, you've got... The 1954 is as early as it goes, right? A little before that. A little before that. Yeah. And then it goes all the way up to, what, 2000s? Yeah. 1990s, yeah. late 1990s? Brand new. Yeah. I Brand got, new. There's some in there that are in the 2000s. Okay. So if you can't, obviously you can't see, but there he's got 1954 and then 1956 and everything after that. That chart of that year is there, and it's he's organized by what? Is it month? It goes by the month after that, and then it goes by the date it charted, or... How does that yeah, work? The the day, like say the date uh, would be like say January fifth of nineteen fifty four. Okay, then the highest chart position for that record on that date would go you know in chronological in order that way. So anything that's um, if it charted a week earlier, I mean that's that's where it goes. So if 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 somebody were to come in and say, oh, it charted at number five. On March 6th in 1972, you could go out and pull out a record and yes. say, this is what charted and this is where it placed. Yes, yeah, so if they knew that, but... Um, Chances are they don't. Well, no, but that's why Joel Whitburn's book, I mean, if you if they want to look up a song, like say Neil Diamond, um, Cracklin' Rosie, you can look up Neil Diamond, Cracklin' Rosie, you know, whatever, 1970, you know, what the date is, and its highest position, I think it was number one, or, you know, I don't remember, number one or five or whatever, and it would be... And the highest, it would be in the number five entry or wherever it's at. And if there was a record on the same date that was, like, say, number one or two, well, then, you know, that takes precedence. Mm -hmm. And it just goes in order that way. Okay, yeah, so it's so very... I, I can find any record, you know, in, in less than 30 seconds that's charted. So it's right. kind of, it works for me. Other people have their other, you know, their own ways, so and that's so, fine. So, yeah, and whatever works for you. Cause right, it's, it's, whatever it's their, they're used to. Whatever they're used to. It may be that it's alphabetical order. Yeah. Granted, I think... 45s might be more difficult alphabetically. Yeah, I think so. Because, I mean, you could have a, a Perry Como next to Nirvana, you know, and to me that just doesn't seem right. No, no that, that I, I can see. Like, I've grown up with this system, so I know it to make sense to me. So I don't really know anything else other than the alphabetical for the LPs and then the 45s are by the how they charted. I mean, I don't mean, you know, obviously Perry Como and Nirvana isn't together in the alphabet, right. but you know what I mean. What are, now that you've been doing it for, what, 30 years, 40 years now? Well, we're close to 50 now. Close to 50 now. I think I bought my first record, I believe it was in 72. 
71 or 72. Okay, yeah, so that's close, getting close to 40, 50 years. When I think about it, my very first record I bought, but I didn't even have a record player at the time, I would, um, I would, was Mr. Soul, I believe, by Buffalo Springfield. Well, the flip side was actually the hit. I don't even remember what it was, but to me, the that that side was the was the best song. That was about 1969 or 70 when I got it. So you got something you couldn't. It's like buying a CD without having a CD player, or mm-hmm. buying an iTunes card now without having an MP3 player. Yep. So it, the equivalent there is you got music. You got you're ready to go to play music. And I, I'd rather have the physical, you know, be able to hold it, you know. And that's kind of the argument today is a lot of people, has music lost its value? Because, I mean, even five years ago before streaming kicked in with Apple Music and Spotify and YouTube, you could buy a, an MP3 for 99 cents. And the the time and money that went into that MP3 it's you've got studio time, you've got the, the gear that was used to record, you've got people being paid, studio time, fees, marketing, everything, all boils down into a 99 cent MP3 file. And it's not even a physical copy. So it, it's nice to see, like even today, I, I think I would prefer a CD because A, it, it's quality, CD quality, and then you have the physical copy. I own this. Whereas an MP3 file, it's as easy as deleting it. Yeah, exactly. Seeing all of the music that you purchased and collected over the years, there's more value to it. And whether that be monetary or even personal value that you may have. So. I agree. Uh, I was saying, what are some of the ways that you find new records today? Because I know you're always searching, having people look for you in garage sales and thrift stores. Or What are some of the ways that you discover new vinyl? Well, about the only way, I, you know, for vinyl, especially for, you know, the last 20 years when they're, I mean, now it's come out on the, the new 180 gram, you know, virgin vinyl or whatever. And I mean, you can buy it now, but for, let's say, the last 20 years or so, about the only way you can find it is on, you know, Discogs or eBay. I prefer eBay myself. And to get the stuff that I've wanted or never found over the years, you know, you got to go on eBay. And you can always, you just about always find what you want on there, you know, but, you know, sometimes you got to pay the price. And price but meaning monetary or? Monetary, yeah, like, you know, like, you know, I buy a lot of Beatles stuff there and it's, you know, there's so many Beatles collectors out there, so it drives the market up a little bit. But, I mean, I mean, you can get, you know, common stuff, but, I mean, relatively cheap. I mean, there's you know you always find some that slip through the cracks and everything, but it's it's still a lot of fun. It's a it's the it's the joy of it, you know, the hunt and everything of, of trying to find new stuff. I guess that too, like you know, that needle, was kind of like a needle in a haystack, except a, a record on the internet. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, I've been lucky and found some you know some good stuff over the years without having to pay an arm and a leg for it. And like you had said the other day. Uh, we had you had a friend over, and they you came over, and you said that just because you got a, something that's Beatles does not mean it's worth right. money. Yeah, because there's cheap Beatles, there's expensive Beatles. Yeah, I mean, I go to places like like sales and everything, and they talk about all the records and everything. Well, I want to keep my, you know, the easy for the most part. They always say I want to keep my Elvis and Beatles. Well, that's fine. You take all them out, you know, and and, and whatever, and I'll give you a fair price for whatever whatever you have left over. Well, that's usually going to be, you know, the stuff that, that you know, they want to keep that and, you know, if they want to sell it or whatever, that's fine. I would more than likely already have it anyway. So, I mean, I'm more interested in, in stuff that you haven't heard of mm-hmm. than what you what you have heard. Because sometimes that's more interesting. Like you, yeah, you never know. What was that record you sold on eBay for? You got it for, or you found it in a box and you sold it for four or $5,000? Yeah, it was almost three. Three thousand? I mean, yeah. It was uh, Graveyard 5. Um, the Graveyard theme, and I can't remember what was on the flip side of it. I remember listening to it. Yeah. It was kind of a garage band. It's one of the... Grungy. It's Yeah, it's psychedelic. Late 60s, they're a California band, and mm-hmm. I guess it was a guitar player or the bass player. I can't remember who it was, but when they played on stage, they would he would uh, actually perform inside of a, a coffin that was standing up. Oh. <laughs> so they were pretty... You know, macabre band, you know. 
kind of like a David Bowie or yeah, they were really off the wall. I mean, really psychedelic, but it you know it's one of the one of the holy grails, if you can say. You know, it's one of the top five. And was that in top ten for sure? That was in the U.S. or was because it was it sold over in Germany? Yeah, right? the Germans. It seemed like 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 the psychedelic stuff the most. I mean, when I when I do sell stuff, it seems like that's that's a, a lot of it goes over there to Germany, and like the the Brits, like the like the, the Northern Soul, a lot. I mean, most most of it are a high percentage of the Northern Soul that I do sell. The extra copies or whatever will go to the Brits. Okay, they love it over there. Okay, that's where it kind of originated. You know, the Northern Soul in Ireland or you know, mm-hmm. in Great Britain. So, how can somebody like my age start looking for records and vinyl and? maybe not collect to this extent, but kind of start keeping an eye out. Like, what are some things they should look for? Well, I guess what I did, you know, it's get what you like. And, I mean, that's that's the place to start. And then if you like this kind of a music, you know, then there's other stuff that kind of branches out from there. Like, like for me in, like, say, the late 70s, I really liked, you know, Cheap Trick was really big, you know, and, and that, that kind of power pop, so I tried to find other power pop bands, you know, and then Aerosmith, you know, which was more of a, you know, you know Boston Bad Boys, and mm-hmm. and and uh, I really liked them, you know, and then, I mean, Jay Giles, I believe, was another Boston area band, and but that kind of rock was good, and then, you know, the when Aerosmith came out, you know, with their first album, I just loved it, and, you know, and that was in 73 or so, and, and it's just, just good old... Just good old, nothing special rock and roll. Mm-hmm. So just basically start. So if you're if you're into '80s hair band, then start getting. Yeah, that. yeah. That's that's the bottom line. Is you know, get what you like, and go from there. Um, there's a lot of new stuff that you can find. I mean, especially online with the a lot of the classics are reissued now. But as far as the the really new stuff. I mean, I guess I'm not really sure. You know, I I don't buy a lot of it like that, but but there's a lot of the the new stuff like the like classic rock that I go and buy mm-hmm. that reissued the 180 gram stuff. You know, right. So you're not picking up a lot of the the newer stuff like because their vinyl's making a big comeback. Yeah, it's huge. It's it's in the billions dollar market now again. And that's why I wanted to to have you on the show is because it's it's such a huge thing, and it's starting to make a huge comeback. And you've had you have forty fifty years under your belt, and you've got all this knowledge. So you're not buying like the new Adele albums. You're not buying the new Bruno Mars stuff like that. That doesn't interest you, or no, I I don't. But you know, it's it's there again. If I run across it at a at a sale, um, you know, I'll pick stuff like that up, and that's about the way it's always been. Mm-hmm. But I won't go out of my way and you know and spend, you know, thirty dollars for a Bruno you know, new Bruno Mars record when I just soon spend that thirty dollars on something I'd rather have. A box not of forty five. Right, you know, it's not that it's bad music or anything. I like it, but. Um, it's just priorities, I guess. Yeah, and plus I think just for me, I I really like the vinyl sound. Yeah, you can't beat the vinyl. An MP3 sounds way different than a vinyl record. Yes, it does. And that's what makes me interested in it. I just love the sound of it. Just a classic sound to it. I I had a friend one time, Roger, come over and we got in a debate. It must have been late eighties because it was when Full Moon Fever came out. And I believe it was eighty nine. And he only said that CDs sound a lot better. Well, I just happened to have a, a new copy of Full Moon Fever, the brand new album. You know, probably only played once or twice. And so I put, you know, queued them both up, you know, and then just did a, a selector switch from CD to vinyl. Okay, here's this one, same song, and here's this one, same song. And which one do you sound better? Well, which one did you pick? He thought for sure you'd be able to tell the difference. Well, he picked the vinyl. And, you know, thinking that he was, you know, going to pick the CD for sure, this should be easy. Well, he liked a, he liked the vinyl better. Mm-hmm. They say there's more information on there. I guess, I'd, you know, I've, I've heard that, you know, but. I guess, so, I guess I don't know the details. 
I'm not really sure either. Yeah, I don't know. Because it's gotten so much better now with the technology, the way the vinyl is. Like Japanese vinyl has always been good because it seems like they always use like virgin vinyl as opposed to uh, um, vinyl in the United States here. You know, they could be, you know, I don't know if it's just recycled, you know, vinyl or how that goes. I guess I'm not sure, but that's why Japanese is always highly sought after because of the sound, the clarity. It's always there. And I know with when in today's industry we have when you're mixing and mastering a song, you have the 16 bit 44 one kilohertz, and that is industry standard. Mm-hmm. We always mix, and mm-hmm. that's the format we go to when we're comparing music and stuff. Of course, there's higher qualities, but at the end of the day, somebody like like mom or grandma or aunts and other family members, they're not going to be able to tell the difference between a 24 bit and a 16 bit wave file. And they probably they don't care either. Right, and the 24-bit to 16-bit WAV file is going to be tw- twice as big. It's going to be huge, and it, it's they're not going to be able to tell the difference between any of them. Coming back to the Bruno Mars thing, do you think or have you seen where records, and I'm sure you have, where records have, you've, you buy them brand new, say, 20, 30 years ago, and for two or three bucks, and now they're worth hundreds if not thousands of dollars. Do you think some can be? Some can be. Does it happen very often? No. No. And why why is that, do you think? Is it just the rarity of the album? Is it the artist? Is it It is a rarity. I mean, there's a there's a big thing with first pressings. First pressings are always good as like uh promos or, you know, usually just, you know, sought after the most because they use the better quality vinyl for the radio stations for airplay. And so um, the quality is just has got to be there for that. I mean, the first pressings, I could say, are is always the, it seems like the, the most common or the most sought after as a rule of thumb. Like for me, a lot of the, a lot of the 45s, I'd rather have the commercial be, um, 45 because they would have a mono and a stereo side on their promos. Well, I'd want to have the B side on a lot of records too. So basically kill two birds with one stone, even though I don't pass up, you know, just the, the promos because it's it's a better quality record. And um, when it comes to, like, first pressings, like, say, you know, Led Zeppelin two comes to mind where they have the Robert, the RL, Robert Ludwig. I, it's It was really a hot mix. And it would actually, you know, could be damaged, jam, damaging on a lot of the speakers that were played at that time, you know, which weren't exactly the, you know, the best in the industry either. And so, I mean, that's a highly sought after record, which, you know, I mean, a promo one of that can, you know, fetch a thousand bucks. And even just a standard copy of it could be, you know, as easily a hundred to two hundred dollars. Mm-hmm. And do you, do you think first pressings are as important to today's vinyl, like the Bruno Mars stuff, or uh, not as much? I think somewhere down the line it may be, but I mean, um, you know, back in those days, you know, a, re- a record would sell, you know, for it to go gold is a half million albums. And, you know, and how many of them were actually, um, you know, how many of them were actually, uh, you know, pressed in that first run? I, You know, I don't know for sure, but like I can think of one like the Meet the Beatles right, firsthand. They didn't have the BMI or the ASCAP credits on it. And there was approximately, I think, um, 200,000 were actually pressed. But they, I mean, they garner a lot of money now. And of those 200,000, only about 10% are in stereo. But, I mean, that's, that's a, you know, it's, it's worth a lot of money these days. So it comes down to a lot of things. It can be something as simple as a printing mistake on a label. That's very true, yeah. It, like forgetting to list the the ASCAP BMI credits, which is in previous episodes, the one with with Davey, we talked about songwriters, right. and ASCAP BMI and CSAC are the ones that collect royalties for songwriters, and with them not being listed on there, that simp- just not having them listed, or on the other side, having them listed can be can make the record worth more, just for a simple printing mistake. Yeah, the mistakes. I mean, with Beatles stuff, I mean that's that's what's really sought after. I mean, those are, 
there's just little things I can't think right in any right off the top of my head right now. But I mean, I know I have a few that are that are like that. You know, that's it just that's just the way it is. It's and it's weird why that would make the it's, album yeah, it's, worth. It's because there's so many people that are looking for the stuff. You know, like in the Beatles market or even Elvis too. That I mean, they want every every variation possible, mistakes included. Like there's some labels that were printed by mistake where they're not there's just the apple slice and there's nothing there's no ink on it there's no nothing on it except for a blank apple mm-hmm. well people like that you know they they you know, to me i mean so it, it's it's just it's a so it's a matter of what people are wanting the market what does the market want yeah the market generates the value for everything and you know there's no exception here either mm-hmm. so which is weird because it's such a niche market and it's kind of an underground thing, in my opinion, for now it's getting bigger. But c- to collectors of your size, they to have them something as simple as a printing mistake drive up the value of a record. You know, how many people are there that have collections to this size and capacity and have the knowledge? Mm-hmm. And for them, that's such a small niche market to drive up such one record of the tens, hundreds of thousands of records that are out there yeah. is, is pretty incredible. Yeah. Like, um, well, one record I can think of right offhand is um, to kind of counter that is Ringo Starr is Drowning in the Sea of Love. It's 1977 in the heart of the disco era. Well, it was, you know, the song, you know, wasn't really that good. It sold really poorly. So there's not many copies of it out there. And so, hence, I mean, it's it's easy to you know look to spend at least a hundred dollars for that forty five, and it's not a very good song. It's just that there's so few out there because mm-hmm. they you know they got withdrawn and and you know where's the rest of them? Yeah. <laughs> well, they're gone. They're gone. So coming back, we went off on a tangent, which is which is great, but kind of coming back to how somebody my age can get into it, or even just anybody looking for wanting to pick up some vinyl records. How do you know if, if a vinyl record is good? Um, what are some things you should look for before you buy the record? Um, aside from, is it an artist you like? Is it music you enjoy? Things like that. What is that actual physical copy? What are some things that make it good? What are some things that make it bad? I know we've talked, you've seen many bad records. You've seen many really good records. What factors into the condition of the record? Um, well, all the... The, you know, the the sound quality is definitely going to be there with the new record. So, I mean, that's that's one reason to get into buying the new stuff. But, it, you know, it's it's not going to be cheap for, like, say, the younger persons to get into, the younger people, the younger generation, you know, because, um, you know, look, look to spend a pretty penny. But as far as buying the used stuff, I mean, you got to, you get the idea once you, once you've bought a few of them, what the condition is in what when you play them. Kind of the main the main thing is the sound quality then. Yeah, yeah that's a big advantage to the new stuff. So, but as far as, you know, like younger people getting into, I mean, what more can you Right. Well let's say let's say let's say I run to a rum and sale and I find a box of records, say something about that size with maybe fifty to seventy five records in them. What are as I'm looking through them, what are some things that I can look for? in the physical condition of the record? Well, a beat-up record is usually, obviously, never going to be any good. Um, the people, I mean, with a, like, say, the trained eye, so to speak, I mean, I look for independent labels, stuff I don't recognize. I look for who produced it, if I recognize the name, the artist, who wrote it. That gives me an idea of, of what's on there. Because, you know, I mean, I've probably paged through millions of records over the years, you know, in, in 40 years. And just little things like that kind of helps. But, I mean, the younger person, you know, more than likely isn't going to know this kind of stuff. Right. So you just, I mean, the basically the price has got to be right. And we're, you know, can, can you buy the whole box for X amount? And the condition, I mean, anything that's beat up, I mean, it's going to sound beat up. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, that's, that's about where you can go. We've picked up records, like say you look at a record and it, say there's a lot of water damage, like the, the, it's really faded. You can tell maybe it's sat in a humid place. The record is warped. Warped records are, are always a no-go. No-go. No-go, they'll never play on anything. I mean, the only reason, the only way I'd buy it is if it was rare. 
So, and to somebody who, like me, would never know a rare record from a cheap record. Um, so, unless it's something you really want and you want to take a chance on it, pass on a warp record. If I don't have it, I mean, I don't mind having a copy that's beat up until, you know, I get the upgrade. So, I, I do that all the time, you know, with, I mean, if I don't have it, and if I need it, you know, in the collection, I mean, I'll pick it up definitely because a copy is better than no copy. Is is there un, is there a way to unwarp it, or will it always be damaged uh, to that point? You know, there probably is. I mean, I've seen people say, you know, you know, stick it in the microwave between glass or the oven, you know, and put it on three for thirty seconds. Yeah. You know, to me, I've just never tried it. I mean, if it's warped, it's warped, and and to me, by once it's warped, the grooves are are moved a little bit. I mean, to get them to fall back into place exactly, uh, you know, just doesn't sound practical to me. So I've never tried it. I've kept, you know, some that are, you know, semi-rare. I've kept them just, you know, until I find an upgrade. Yeah. So basically, in if warp records are no good and if it's not warped or even, like, what if it's dirty, like has a lot of dirt on it? Well, grime is, uh, I mean, that can be clean to some extent, but, I mean, it's still going to sound... You know, it'll, as a rule of thumb, I've always used it. It's going to, it's going to sound like it looks, you know, so um, they can be cleaned. I mean, you got disc washers. I mean, if you want to spend the money, there's very good ones out there. What so, are, what are some good ones? Do you know any offhand? So for I, maybe looking for one. I, well, I know disc washer is like a relatively cheap one that you can use. And I've seen one. I don't even have one. I just use the old conventional uh, record cleaner fluid, and um, I used to use rubbing alcohol, clean it off real good. I mean, you would get a lot of it, but it doesn't clean out the grooves like you would like to. Mm -hmm. That's why you got to take care of your needles. Try to take care of, keep the dust off, and you know, do the best you can before you play them, mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So, we'll I'll put anything that he's mentioned, like the book you had mentioned, to keep them. Uh, organized. I'll put that in the show notes. I'll put some uh, recommendations. You can find one or two on your phone, and we'll put those in the show notes as well. So if if you are in the market for buying a disc washer or the what's the title of the book you use? Uh, Joel Woodburns. Joel Woodburns. I'll put that in the description Whit as well. Woodburns. Woodburns. Um, I'll put that in the description if you are interested in purchasing that and and getting some more information as well on that. He's the authority for for cataloging. The Hot 100 and has been since the 50s. Okay, so it's kind of well, like... He's cataloged it, virtually everything from the late 1800s. Oh, wow. Yeah. So it's like the go-to. Yeah. That's why you see mine up here that starts from 1954, because that was basically the start of the rock and roll era. So about the middle to late 54, late, I like to fall of 54. And I expanded to his uh, other book, 1944, you know, the pop period. That's why I have earlier ones there. Okay. So they're not, obviously, the 45s aren't going to be original from the middle 40s, but, you know, they're they're repressed, you know, reissues of the song. Like, say, Chattanooga Shoeshine Boy and, you know, just whatever. You know, you know they have a lot of wartime stuff that, that was redone. Okay. So, yeah, we'll, we'll put that in the show notes below so you can uh, check that out. And if you're interested in cataloging, cataloging uh, your vinyl records the same way that Dad does, then you can definitely do so. Um, and we may, I even may link a little bit of a video or some more information on that book and how he catalogs as well. So when you're, for somebody like you, professional, and somebody who collects, there's different ratings that you have when you're looking for vinyl records, say on eBay. Uh, they're like VG, VG+. Plus. And what does that stand for? And can you kind of go over the, the different titles of them and what would a record look like in its condition? Yeah, like the industry standard is is what they call gold mine standards. And virtually anybody of, of you know, my age or whatever, no, anybody that collects knows what they say with the gold mine standards. And it basically is like G, which is good. They say oh, this record is good. Well, a good record by the by the gold mine standard is is borderline garbage. The only reason you keep it is because it's, you know, you know, semi rare. And um, but or and like I say earlier, you know, it's I'll keep it just till I get a better copy. Then there's there's you know G and then there's V, or VG, very good. You know, they, they add pluses. Some people add you know too many pluses in my opinion. But it used to be just G VG, you know, VG plus. 
you know, and then VG++ and then near Mint and then Mint. Well, to me, um, Mint, even a brand new record has never been open, might not be Mint because it, to me, it's got to be absolutely perfect. If there's any dent in the corner, to me, that's not Mint anymore. It's near Mint, which is, you know, 90 to 95% which is, you know, always acceptable. Mm-hmm. But a lot of people overgrade when they're selling. And I've had to send back records all the time. In fact, I just sold, sent some back today that I got in the mail. You know, and he called everything VG+. Plus. Well, to me, if it's if it's two, I'll let, you know, one one grade slide. But if it's two grades like a VG, when he called it, you know, a VG++, plus plus, you know, that's that's not acceptable. And... But a, a VG record will have lots of scratches. You know, none of these records will be warped. A G record might be warped. A good, or they call it G plus, will have tons of scratches on it and virtually unplayable. And But a VG should be acceptable. We'll have lots of scratches on it. But And VG plus will have a few scratches on it, but still a respectable record. I would always be happy with a VG plus record until I get a better copy, you know, but I ain't going to go out of my way to replace a VG plus record. Something that's absolutely playable. Right. And then a VG plus plus, I mean, that's right next. I mean, just a couple small little, I mean, you can scratch a record by just putting it in and out of the sleeve. Mm-hmm. And that's where a lot of them will come from, actually. And so when you play a record a lot, I mean, people don't realize it, but over the years, these little paper scuffs, they call them, will, you know, degrade the degrade the vinyl and a near mint should look should look brand new because that's roughly you know about 90 at least 90 95 percent of perfect of perfect so so getting that mint is is very difficult it's not yes and to find a mint one you'll have to pay a premium price if you're looking for like say an ebay or discogs because if you got a, especially a you know anything that's rare and it's in mint condition you're going to pay the price because that's the ultimate. I mean, that's that's the same as finding, like, you know, like, say, a baseball card with that's perfectly squared, corners are sharp, you know. Mm-hmm. It makes a big difference. So even, it's it's kind of mind-blowing, but so when a, when a vinyl record is printed, say, let's talk about today's, and it's shipped, and when you purchase it, maybe nobody's even touched that record other than it being shipped from the factory to the store. You pick it up, and there's one little scratch on it. It's not mint anymore. I wouldn't call it mint, but I would definitely call it near mint because so, mint is mint. I mean, mint is mint is mint. Mint is mint. In my opinion, yeah. other people will see otherwise. I mean, I bought I bought records from you know well known dealers. I mean, you know, people in my business know know his name, and every time I've I've gotten a record from them, I mean, I'm definitely calling this at least one grade lower. So I mean, even. You know, even he does different, Mm -hmm. you know, by the industry standard. So there's a little bit of finessing between. Yeah, it's it's always in, you know, in everybody's opinion. Now, I mean, what they see and what they don't see. And I mean, but I mean, to be honest, I mean, a record that has a lot of scratches, you can't call a VG++. Mm -mm. The different types of needles, because once you buy a record, do you need to know what to play? Can you talk a little bit about the different types of needles, what makes a good one, what makes a bad one, kind of price ranges, um, and then at record players as well. And then if you wanted to talk on speakers, but, I mean, you've had these speakers for 20 years, 30 years now, yeah, 30 years so something. we don't really have a lot of comparison between, but I'm sure you've listened to some on Friends and your uncles and things like that on different speakers. So talk a little bit about what makes a good needle, what is a good needle, how much you can expect to pay, maybe some entry-level ones, some really expensive ones. Usually, I guess when it comes to that, um, is what you can afford. You should always buy what you can afford. I mean, the better the better needle is always going to be worth the money. It'll bring out more information, you know, the cartridge and the needle together. I mean, there's good, there's good combinations. That's kind of what I've always used. I mean, back in the old days, I used to have, you know, um, just consumer reports, you know, something like that that would tell you what. But now 
when you you can look online, it's at it's at just a click of the mouse, and you can find what people think of it. And so that's that's what you can what people can kind of do now. And as far as you know, and it's, it's buying what you can afford and getting the best bang for your buck. I mean, you can you can you know find decent you know combos for for fifty bucks. I mean, I usually spend you know not much more. You know, hundred bucks, I guess, hundred to hundred and fifty. But I mean, a good entry level one. I mean, you can find good ones for fifty dollars. And that you would know, Audio Technicas. I mean, whatever you know. That's pretty entry level. But yeah, you wouldn't want right. to go. You wouldn't want to spend like ten, fifteen dollars on one. No, no, I wouldn't. No. That's you might as well buy. <clears> one not anybody it. that's even remotely serious about playing vinyl. Yeah, I mm-hmm. mean, I wouldn't. Um, I would have a hard time wanting to play good records on them. You know, because. They would damage so easy, and mm. and once the needle starts getting rounded out, I mean, you're you're damaging your record every time you play it. And if it's ten, That's, fifteen dollars, that means right. it's probably actually was only made for a buck. If yeah, and, and yeah, and you want to buy, you know, you want to buy them regularly because you don't want them to get wore out. Because like I say, once they get wore out, you know, you lose the point off your needle, and you got a rounded needle or whatever, and and you start, you know making grooves in, in your vinyl and, and then you don't want that either and then you're ruining the vinyl and you're ruining vinyl every time you play it yep. you won't notice it the first time the second time but say a hundred times as opposed to I mean that's just something you just don't notice but it's happening you're you know you're ruining it especially especially <laughs> if it's something that's that you play often right you'll wear yeah. it out real quick and then when it comes to turntables I mean that's just a matter of um, you can get a lot of good turntables, but to me, it just seems like putting the right cartridge and you know needle and cartridge together for it is what what ends up uh, you know bringing everything out anyway. Right, because you can you can spend. I mean, all of, all the the record player has to do is is spin the record at the right speed. Yeah. Right. There's nothing else that kind of contributes to the sound other than the speed of it. Yeah, you want to be able to adjust it, you know, and, you know, even entry-level ones, you know, a lot of times will at least do that. Like the one that I had, we, I sold it, the one yeah. that you bought for that me. that was terrible. That was terrible because it pitched it up yeah. probably two, two different keys. Yeah. And you play, we played, what was it, an Aerosmith song? And they Led sounded Zeppelin like Led Zeppelin or whatever, yeah. Led Zeppelin, or it sounded like they were a chipmunk. So yeah, yeah, it, it was, was, yeah, instead of playing at 33, it was, you know, probably playing at, you know, 40. 40, you yeah. Know? It was it was just spun too fast. So, 40, yeah, it and was, both of our our music ears could hear that that awful pitch instantly. Instantly, I when I first the the first measure, I could tell this is too the drums are even pitched because it's spinning too fast. The faster it spins, the higher pitch it's going to be. And yeah. The slower it is, the lower pitch it's going to be. Yeah, and it's a recognizable brand too. You know, you'd think they would would have had a better product. I would have thought it would have been a little bit, especially for the price you paid. For it was about a hundred bucks. Yeah, it's a hundred dollars. A hundred bucks. You would have thought it would have been a little bit of a different sound. Mm-hmm. Um, but it is what it is, and I I sold it and we got uh, money back for it. So we talked a little bit about the needles, and I wanted to come back to the point of when we're talking about the quality of the or the condition of the vinyl record. When you're talking a little bit about how how a dirty record is it's gonna if it looks dirty it's gonna sound dirty and if when we clean the records you want to make sure that they're cleaned very well because otherwise even that microscopic dust is being picked up and the needles picking that up right yes and that can factor into ruining a, a really yeah. good needle potentially an expensive needle in the long run it will and that's that's um that's why I stress the importance of cleaning it first adequately and then using a, a dust filter or, you know, a dust cleaner or whatever you call it, you know, just... Like a microfiber cloth or something. Right, even that, you know, you can do that. And static-free, you know, you want to, you know, get the static out of the records. I mean, there's products that you can buy, the the cloths and and the, the, the dust sweepers. So that's something that you should always use. We'll put some of those products in the show notes as well in case you're not really sure where to even start with cleaning one. Should, say, you pick up a record, you want to clean it with your shirt, or is that a big no-no? No, I wouldn't do that because, you never, you, you know, your shirt's going to have all kinds of stuff that you've brushed up against. I mean, you probably got more stuff in your shirt than you do. I mean, but I always use clean cloths. Um, clean, it's got to be that. And then um, a spray, you know, some kind of a record cleaning, 
you know, solution. It could even be like rubbing alcohol, like you had said, right? Yeah, that's, that's, that's all right. You know, that's what I used for years back, you know, before I knew anything, you know, when back in the seventies and stuff. Mm -hmm. So even into the eighties, as far as that goes. Right. Make sure that when you're cleaning the records that you're cleaning them thoroughly and on a flat surface, you know, to, to get it good. I mean, obviously you don't want it, you know, not if it's not sitting flat. I mean, you could be, you know, could end up breaking it depending on what your, what your record is made out of. If it's, is it vinyl or is it styrene? You know, styrene is more susceptible to breaking. Mm -hmm. I mean, albums aren't styrene, you mm -hmm. know, but I mean, 45s, you know, mm -hmm. there's some that are. Like a lot of the Columbia ones are made, you know, out of styrene and a lot of A&M are made out of styrene, mm -hmm. but, but no albums mm -hmm. for the most part aren't. Okay. So make sure that when you're cleaning your records, make sure that they're, they're, use you're using the right cleaner, you're using the right cloth, you're not using your shirt, you're not using your jeans, you're not using uh, Yeah, I, I just basically wouldn't sit it in my lap, you know, and, and then just start, and then you know, putting pressure on it, you know. Because then you're rubbing it against whatever right. you're wearing. Yeah, I mean, it's if anything, it's transferring, you know. Yeah. So it just make sure that you're taking the necessary, especially if you're passionate about it and you, and you care about how it sounds in five years. Are there any specific brands of needles kind of coming back a little bit or record players that you would recommend like especially over the years you'm sure you've heard good needles you've heard bad needles yeah i mean i kind of go in spurts i guess i don't recall which one i just got i guess i have it right over here i mean i've liked uh, the stantons i've like but i know i know you talk about stanton i know you have you've added one or two to your your ebay cart and what was it was it five thousand dollars or something like that <laughs> yeah it was like eight or nine thousand eight or nine thousand dollars <laughs> for uh for a record needle this is the one i just got is the um, sure the sure the m97 e and i haven't put it on yet but you know this is basically one i just you know did a few clicks did a little bit of research and it seemed to be like a consensus you know good one for what people are were you know, talking about at the time there. Well, plus, it's got Sure on it. Sure is a very reputable name in audio gear, in microphones, in in boards, in you name it. I don't remember what I paid for this one, but this is probably, you know, give or take a hundred or so, I imagine. Okay, so and I'll put a link in this in the show notes uh, below, so you can check that needle out if you're in the market for that. Um, and how can one find these things? You just eBay. Amazon. Uh, yeah, eBay. I mean, there's there's all kinds of uh, different websites, you know, like Vinyl Engine. I mean, if you once you start clicking for cartridges and needles, I mean, you'll have a ton of them to, that come up and you just have to uh, go through the trouble of clicking on them and, and find a consensus of what people like out there. It's kind of go similar. to those websites. It's similar to buying anything else, maybe a refrigerator, a vacuum, whatever. Yeah, you do a little bit of research. You too. find yeah. one that's in your budget, and then you find one that's got good reviews. Yeah, right. It's the same thing. Yeah, same thing. Just like buying a toaster, you know. Yeah, <laughs> same thing as buying a toaster. Yep. People can't see these. How you have these stored? So, talk a little bit about storing your vinyl. What are some of the do's and don'ts? A definite don't is laying them flat. Um, you don't want to stack them flat. And, I mean, I don't know if it's just susceptible to warpage, but, I mean, I just, it just, not, never a way to go. But they should always be upright. And, you know, like my better ones, I'll I'll pull the, um, the vinyl out and put it in a, a rice paper sleeve or, you know, a poly-lined sleeve out of the album cover and store it inside um some poly, I mean, they have different, I mean, depends on what you want to spend, but put them in a plastic album jacket. I mean, they have resealable flaps. I mean, you can spend a lot of money, and if you have, you know, if you have thousands of albums, I mean, that's a pretty penny, but it's it's cheap in the long run for what you are um, trying to preserve. I mean, you want to keep your albums new and everything, inside and out. Cover, to me, is important. So, I mean, that's that's one of the ways to do it. And the same with you know, the 45 should, you know, records should always be upright. And they should, you know, be um, like, like say, you know, my better ones is the same thing over there too. I'll put them in polyline sleeves and inside a plastic. 
and um, that's just a, a good habit to get into. It's a little bit of money, but it's money well spent. It's an investment. It is an investment. You already got one, and you might as well just add another, you know, a little bit to preserve, preserve them all. Preserve it. And so basically... Uh, 45 sleeves is definitely, you know, pull them instantly out of the out of the sleeve and separate them. You know, even if it's just a, a regular white paper sleeve, you know, get it out of there and put it in and put it in a, 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 a plastic jacket. Mm -hmm. And then you can, then you can just slide the, the cover on front or in the back right. of the record. Right. In front of it, I do, yeah. Okay, yeah, so you don't have to, like, take the sleeve out and just throw it in a box. No. Put, just tuck the sleeve or put the vinyl record in the white sleeve and then just tuck right. the, the actual sleeve on the front. Yeah, so he's got the vinyl record in the white sleeve, and then on the front he slid the actual cover inside of the sleeve just so he knows which record it is, and, and it also keeps the sleeve in good shape as well. Otherwise, it'll it'll make the ring marks. I'm sure everybody's noticed the the ring marks in your albums by having them inside, you know, the album. And in the long run, you know, I know it would take a lot longer once they're outside, you know, to make a record marking. And you know, especially darker colored um, albums, you know, they'll they'll notice right away the um, you know the 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 wear the wear factor in them. So I mean, it's just it's just a good way to do it. I mean, especially the better ones. That, I mean, some you know you don't really care if they're in, they're inside or not. I mean, I have lots of albums we all do that are like that. You know, you could really you know care less about it, but something that's cheaper. Yeah, you know, it's like you know to me like a you know like a theater whatever. act or whatever. Yeah, like a theater performance. So another thing would be temperature. Is that does it have to be in a certain, like humidity as well? Because I know I've I've had. I've told you about records that have been stored in garages that are in up in the Midwest here. Well, we have all four seasons up here. So you're getting the summer, this winter, you're getting the heat, the cold, humidity, the rain, the snow, you're getting all these things. And that can really take a toll on a record. Yeah. And, you know, like a lot of people will store their records if they just got out, if they're moving or whatever, they'll just set them on the basement floor on the concrete. Well, that's, you know, that's, you know, that's drawn moisture. And eventually, you're going to get a, a moldy record by that, you know. Or warped. Uh, or, you know, or warped, you know, just from stacked on top of each other there too, a box on top of a box on top of a, a box. You know, a definite no-no. I mean, uh, most collectors that are serious about it, they know better, but it's it's just easy to do. You know, I'll just set these here for now. And, you forget about them. Yeah, and you forget about them, and you know, and you get a little bit of moisture. I mean, it doesn't take much water, and you just ruined a box of records. Mm -hmm. You know, especially if it's in cardboard. You know, so I mean, I, I've ran across you know hundreds, probably thousands of records where, and I've got just a little bit of water damage, and it you know, it all seeps up. You absolutely ruin the album. Well, the album cover. I mean, if you ruin the album cover, I mean. So, you know who wants a record that's got water damage on? It? I mean, you can't even you can't even give them away. Mm -mm. So I mean, that's just one of the you know another one of the don'ts. We've talked. We've also talked a little bit about the the cleaning. Um, we kind of because because the last point I have here is like the do's and don'ts of vinyl collecting. So we talked about cleaning them. We talked the do's and the don'ts. The good things to do when you're cleaning the do uh, the don'ts when you're cleaning. Storing them, we just cover, don't store them on the basement temperature, store them in, in good sleeves. You want to kind of environmentally control though too, like here where it's we get hot summers and cold winters. Well, you get dry air in the wintertime and, and you know, and in summertime it's it's the humidity's way up. So I run a dehumidifier in here mm -hmm. um, just to protect them. I mean and same with the musical instruments, guitars and everything. I mean, you want to keep everything kind of environmentally controlled, you know, and, and um, you know, dehumidifier in the summertime and a humidifier in the wintertime mm -hmm. because it's so dry. I mean, I, I don't know what the ideal is, but, you know, probably 40%, you know. I mean, if you walk downstairs in your basement, 50. Or wherever you store it, and you, you could recognize a noticeable humidity, chances are it's too humid for the records as well, correct? Yeah. Like if it's if it's very humid and and hot, yeah. Then chances are it's probably too well. Hot the for album, especially if they're outside of a, a plastic sleeve and just a regular album, I mean, eventually that's gonna absorb the humidity, the moisture in the air. 
And in the long run, I mean, you're doing damage. Mm-hmm. And we, we also talked about like the do's and don'ts of kind of discovering like what to look for and the condition of the records. And so is there anything else that you had that you wanted, like the tips and tricks or do's and don'ts of, of vinyl collecting, whether it be from first starting to kind of getting started to um, actually collecting, looking for, purchasing, anything like that? Are there any like things that you messed up on early in the early, in the earlier days that you kind of look back on and be like yeah it's easy to go I mean everybody has that I wish I would have kept that car when I bought it I mean I mean I have stuff that I regret not buying over the years I mean I've had I I mean I think of one time in particular I mean I had a, a, a very rare Beatles record I didn't think I've never seen one or even heard of one and it was for ten dollars but I didn't think it was a U.S. pressing you know because it was that rare and you know, here I find out like a month later, then I've seen it on eBay and it sold for $700. I mean, just little things like that. But as far as, um, I mean, I just wish I would have, you know, bought even more back in the day and more quality stuff when I did buy it rather than just settle for like, say, a VG copy. I wish I would have got at least a grade or two. But nowadays I buy a lot of stuff I mean, especially when I find it like in the, you know, the dollar box for say, I mean, I have lots of like your brother's friends. I mean, I have friends that, you know, I just, I'll just buy it for them because it's cheap and I start other people, young people, friends of mine, you know, help them out with mm-hmm. their collections. And that's one thing that's always, you know, kind of gratifying too, I guess. But, Gifting it. Yeah. Just, just helping other people out, especially starting young kids out. I mean, I've gave away a lot of. A lot of stuff to, you know, just people, you know, in their 20s, you know, get them started and mm-hmm. get them addicted like mm-hmm. I am, yeah. you know. Hopefully it doesn't. <laughs> you never know. They'll probably end up with, you know, passing me up someday. I don't yeah. know, you know, but it's just, it's just fun to get them started. I like to see young people collecting rec- records. It's kind of a, it's kind of a hobby. It's kind of a community as well. You know, you understand, you, cause you have, you can definitely understand the, the, the feeling of getting records and being gifted and, and what it, what it takes and what it's like to do something like this. So kind of passing it on to somebody my age or younger or a little older is, you know what it's like for somebody who's passionate as well. Cause you were once in their shoes. Yeah, I, I was. And, um, I was always, you know, at parties, I always, when we got there, I mean, I always liked playing the records and, you know, some people would, they would just have a, but they'd always have, you know, like 50 to 100 albums and I always want to be the one to play them, you know, so we don't end up with, you know, Barry Manilow going on the radio at a party or whatever, you know, but. It's not really a party starter, is it? Uh, no, but I mean, it's a possibility, so I took no chances. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Get away from my turntable here. I got yeah, this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, but it's, um, it's, it's just stuff like that. That's it's always been kind of fun, I guess. And then, like I say, it's um, the starting, you know, it, you'd be surprised that it just kind of snowballs on you. Like for me, who I've always loved music, and once you get started in it, it seems like once you get 50, you've got to have 100, you know, and it just, you find more stuff that you like. And, may, you know, maybe they don't want to buy the CDs anymore, you know, but... So it's kind of like, I don't know. It's, this is the old. Or, or just buy the, the stream music or what do you call it? Yeah. yeah. So the, you know, cause now you don't use Spotify, but we all have Apple music and you don't go, you don't know as much about it as, as the modern people do, because this is your passion. Yeah. This is what you're familiar yeah. with. So picking up a box of records is that you have nothing that you don't know anything about is very similar to. What Spotify does these days is Spotify watches and listens to what you listen to over the year or every week. And then they, at the end of the week, they create a playlist for you of music you may like based on the stuff you've listened to. You listen to rock, you listen to dance music, you listen to jazz, you listen to classical. Well, here's a playlist of stuff you haven't listened to yet, but you might like. Yeah. It's very similar, yeah. except this way it's it's more organic. It's natural. Mm-hmm. A box of records, you don't know what you're going to get no, in there. No, I've, I've found a lot of stuff that way by, like say, 
uh, a box of forty fives and I don't recognize it, you know. But it's you know it's kind of a cool label. I'll put that on. Oh, well, you know that's pretty good there. Right. You know that's that's something different. Right. You know and um, but uh, there's there's nothing better than finding like say a box of records that's got you know the forty fives that are that are still on the sleeves because you know they're going to be in decent shape, or or buying a box of of albums and. You get a lot of seventies bands that you know, like I have never heard of, you know, and just put them on for the first time just to see what it's like. Do you, I mean it's easy to do research on them now too to see, you know, what else I got if I like it. Hey, maybe I'll I really like it. And what do you do if you find it and you want it on your phone? You go on Apple Music or Spotify and you download it. Yeah, it's that easy. It's that easy these days. I mean, it sits all right to have copies like that. You know, yeah, it's just something especially you, you run around in your car, you ain't gonna be playing your album. You know, so <laughs> you could have a pretty intriguing rig if you had a vinyl record player yeah. in your in your car. Well, unless there's anything else you want to add, um, tips and tricks, or anything you think we missed on, we can go back and talk a little bit more on. Yeah, right off the top of my head, I guess I can't really think of anything. And thanks for giving me the time. I guess. Yeah, thanks for being on the show. I thought this would be kind of a unique topic because it's kind of cool. Vinyl's <laughs> making a comeback, and I thought it would. I know a guy. Yeah, I think you've been vinyl. around vinyl pretty much your whole life. Pretty much my whole <laughs> life, yep. So when I thought, well, that'd be kind of a fun topic. So I thought, well, when I'm coming home for the holidays, I might as well bring my little my little Zoom handy recorder and hook it up and shoot the shit, I guess. <laughs> so thanks for being on the show. I hope you guys enjoyed the conversation. And uh, Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you so, so much for tuning into the 14th episode of When Life Hands You Lennons. I hope that you enjoyed my conversation with my father, and I really enjoyed sitting down with him and chatting with him about vinyl records, as it's something that he's very truly passionate about and also very knowledgeable about. So I hope that you enjoyed the conversation. Just a reminder to please sign up to my mailing list, as it helps notify you when new episodes are live, as well as sign up to my podcast or my Patreon account and help donate, because it does help me grow the show and funnel money back into the show so that I can grow it for you and make it better for all of you. I also encourage you to leave a five-star rating within Apple Podcasts or whichever platform you choose to listen in as it does greatly help the show get boosted and help it be discovered by other listeners. Lastly, there is a guest request form in the show notes below. So if you or somebody you know would be a very good guest on the show, please fill it out and it will come to me and I will reach out and we can discuss about getting you booked on the show. Thank you so much for your support and everything else that you do for this show. I really appreciate it. And I hope you enjoyed my conversation with my dad, Doug Seahawk, and we'll see you on the next episode next week on When Life Hands You Lennons. <laughs>